point one from the third charge, reads as following. The ING group aided, abetted and incited several artificial legal persons, prominent amongst them being four artificial legal persons known as the ABCD group. That includes Archer Daniels Midlands, an American national, a second named Bunge, originally a Dutch national established in 1818, who has since acquired multiple nationalities, including the British overseas territories of Bermuda. The third named Cargill, an American national, and the fourth named Louis Dreyfus Company, a Dutch national, and financed them to forcibly confiscate land, land belonging to the humans and non-humans in different regions of Brazil, to deforest those lands and establish monocultural plantations of soy and sugar cane for profit, use poisonous pesticides that has caused intergenerational harm to the health and well-being of all species, and engage in violence and repression against the inhabitants of different regions of Brazil. Second, ING Group financed Cargill, Bunge and other artificial legal person named Kofco, a Chinese national, to purchase Viagril and Alianca, Brazilian nationals, after they were found guilty and fined 12 million reals for deforesting northern Mato Grosso regions and illegally establishing soy plantations there with a view to aiding and abetting Cargill, Bunge and Kofco to continue the criminal activities in the place of Viagril and Alianza. Three, despite explicit prohibitions on buying, trading and exporting produce grown on confiscated and deforested lands, deforested lands in Amazonia after 2008, ING Group financed Bunge, Cargill, ADM and Kofco to purchase, trade and export agricultural produce illegally cultivated in different deforested regions of Amazonia. Four, the ING Group financed Bunge, LD, LDC and Cargill to forcibly confiscate lands belonging to the communities in the Tapajos re regions of Amazonia, in the state of Para, the Guarani indigenous regions of sovereign Brazil and the Munduruku nation in the regions of Planalto Santa Reno. Five, since 2000, ING Group has financed Bunge, Car Cargill and Luis Dreyfus Company to use poisonous pesticides over large areas of land causing harm to multiple generations of different species living in the regions, the rivers, waters and trees and deprive them of the conditions necessary for life. Six, ING Group has refused to disclose information about the number of artificial persons it finances to undertake harmful activities, the extent, scale and scope of the harms that are regularly caused as a result, and the extent, scope and scale of activities undertaken by artificial legal persons acting on ING Group's financial directions. Seven, ING Group issued bonds to raise even more money under the name Green Bonds, with the intention of misleading the people of Brazil and those seeking to reclaim the conditions necessary for the lives of all species internationally and use the money raised through the Green Bonds to finance the expansion of Kofco, Bunge, Cargill and Luis Dreyfus Company and empower them to confiscate more land, deforest larger areas of forests, expand commercial monocultural plantation agriculture and trade and export agricultural produce grown on confiscated land and acted as their overseer and financial supervisor. These activities, if proved to be true, constitute intergenerational climate crimes against past, present and future generations of humans, non-humans, cultures and ecosystems in Brazil under section 3, A, B, C and D of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. May I now call upon our witness, our third witness, to present evidence uh, on, uh, in support of the charges. Our third witness today is Fabrina Furtado. Fabrina is professor in the Department of Development, Agriculture and Society at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. Furtado will address will present her evidence and use PowerPoints and other evidentiary material. And uh, I now call upon Fabrina Furtado to present your evidence. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, morning, hard time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank 
the organizers uh, for inviting uh, me to share with you some of the findings that we've had in a few years of, of monitoring and um, researching and from actions related to the agribusiness model in Brazil and the actors involved, including banks and, and investment funds. Um, I thank you for this opportunity, congratulate on, on the initiative and just like to briefly say that I would very much like to be with all of you now, but as you know, Brazil is one of the countries where the pandemic has been harder uh, to control or to live with. You know, we've had 607,000 deaths until now. Uh, so we're living with a health uh, pandemic, but also a political pandemic with a liberal authoritarian government that ignores and worsens this reality, which is the Bolsonaro government. So I'm going to give, first of all, a brief uh, general overview uh, of what we're talking about when, when we discuss the agribusiness economy in Brazil, and then I'll go into uh, specific cases. So first slide, please. No, so we're, it's a historical process that doesn't start today, no, but from colonization and, and all the processes related to, to enslavement, that, that puts us in a situation of, a, of from primitive accumulation to accumulation by dispossession, which we will see through the slides. Next slide, please. So just briefly to say that from colonization, Brazil has been inserted into the global economy as a dependent and subordinate uh, country in the division, uh, international division of labor, going from being an object of dispossession to what today we call a platform for, night, for financial valuation and a producer and exporter of primary goods to benefit the development of northern countries. Next slide, please. And as a result of this process, we have created a powerful agribusiness sector, becoming one of the biggest players in international agricultural markets, expanding the frontiers of accumulation and renewing forms of exploitation, including land, speculation and dispossession. Next slide, please. So this is just to, sh to show you how uh, the participations of commodities in total export has been growing in terms of concentration in the last few years, from 2008 to, to now 2000, the first, month, the first month of 2020, there has been an increased concentration of commodities in total exports. And this is what the, the development logic in Brazil is based on, the export of these commodities. Next slide, please. This is just to show the main products um, being exported the first few they may change position but in general what we mostly export are soybeans uh, then oil and mining related uh, materials cellulose corn meat so uh, products related to the agribusiness which includes um, agricultural commodities but also mining and oil next slide please this is a list of the main uh, countries to which uh, we export, just to have an idea, this is this year. So, but these are, uh, for the last few years, have been the main countries uh, to which Brazil exports. No? So it's China, European Union, Argentina, Netherlands is also one of the top countries which receives commodities uh, from Brazil. Next slide, please. Okay. Brazil has also become one of the four main destinations for transnational land deals worldwide, increasing every year. Next slide, please. And these are the companies, the main companies uh, involved in these land deals, no? many of which uh, have been mentioned as, as um, commodities traders that have received the support of ING. So Bungi, Cargill, Cossan, Kofco, DuPont, all of them in the, in the field of agriculture are the ones mostly involved in these land deals. Next slide, please. In this map, now turning specifically to the production of soy, we can see how 
the, ex the, the area planted with soybeans in Brazil has um, increased intensively uh, since the 70s until this is 2018, but the, the production continues to increase. So it's, it's all over Brazil mainly now and, and um, going into the agriculture's frontiers, overcoming the agriculture's frontier, expanding on the agriculture's fr frontiers every year. Next slide, please. And these are the corporations dominated specifically the, the production um, of soy in Brazil. Cargill, Bungi, ADM, LDC, Amagi, Gavlan, Kofco. Next slide, please. So now I will say a few words about um, what this means, this agribusiness agri economy means in terms of the territories in terms of, of environmental and climate crimes. So we have uh, one of the highest uh, levels of deforestation uh, in the world, which has been increasing, uh, uh, started decreasing for a few years, but in the last, uh, this, this year, sorry, last year and this year, it has reached the highest levels uh, since 2008. Next slide, please. This is a map for you also to have an idea how agribusiness has uh, drastically reduced forests in Brazil. No, uh, So the first map in 1986 is specifically in the Mato Grosso region, which is one of the, the states most responsible uh, for, for the production and, and exports of soy and meat and other products related to, to the agribusiness. So from 86 and 2016, we can see a drastic reduction in the cover of forests in, in that region. Next slide, please. And it's important to mention also that 90% of deforestation is a result of environmental crimes. Although there's an increasing uh, attempt to separate what is called illegal deforestation from legal deforestation, we see uh, both cases as a problem, especially because 96% of this uh, deforestation is a result of environmental crimes. Next slide, please. And a fifth of soy exports from the Amazon and the Sahado region to the EU are traced back to what is called illegal deforestation. Next slide, please. Next, okay. Um, and of course, these forests don't exist in empty spaces, although many uh, continue to try uh, to argue. This, these, these forests are in territories occupied by different um, indigenous, traditional and, and small farmers uh, here in Brazil. And as a result of this agribusiness economy, Brazil has been for years now in the top of the list made by Global Witness of the, the deaths of land and environmental uh, defenders. This is 2018, but uh, the last, the other years also Brazil was between second and, and, and first also. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is land conflicts in Brazil to see that it has also been increasing now and in the, the Bolsonaro government especially we have seen uh, an increase in the land conflicts uh, in the country. Next slide please. Most of these conflicts are related to land conflicts as uh, and related to agribusiness uh, corporations and large uh, farmers and also uh, related to indigenous ter territories, or, or indigenous people struggling to maintain themselves in, in their territories. There are other conflicts related to labor issues and hate crimes, for example, against uh, the landless peasants movements or against indigenous movements. Uh, but most of the, the cases are related to conflicts over land uh, in relation to agribusiness corporations and large farmers. Next slide, please. We are also one of the countries that most consumes uh, pesticide in the world. Next slide, please. 
and this is a graph that shows the number of pesticides being registered in, in Brazil throughout the years, uh, to mention that the last two years, the last few years of the, of the Bolsonaro government has seen a, a record in, in pesticides registered in a country, most of which uh, are prohibited in the EU. Next slide, please. This agribusiness economy leads to highly concentrate, concentrated uh, land in Brazil, where just 1% of rural properties occupy almost half of all rural areas, while smallholder hold, farmers with less than 10 acres occupy only 2.3%. Next slide, please. And this land concentration uh, has, is also related to our history of colonization and slavery being one of the most uh, racist um, countries in the world with highly concentrated of land um, held by, by whites in the country. So the larger the land, the more white it is. And the, the, the smaller the pieces of land are owned by African Brazilian or indigenous people. Next slide, please. No. And it and it's interesting also to 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 show how the agribusiness is white in terms of what it what is produced. So if you look at the the soya plantations, uh, the majority of the the owners of land producing soya are white, which is the the white the the sorry the blue the blue part, and the yellow is the black uh, population. Coffee, uh, sugarcane, corn are also extremely white and when you go down to to uh, artisanal fishing or, or extractive uh, artisanal extraction in in forest then these are products that are mostly carried out by black and indigenous people next slide please agribusiness is also male the majority of of owners so the major are, are male so the land tenure and land titles are, um, are mainly in the hands of of white men here in Brazil. Next slide, please. So this is mainly to say that the the Brazilian developmental logic is based on a, a agribusiness economy. So based on the the extraction um, of natural resources, uh, the the production and exports of commodity that are that that requires constant pressure both in terms of extensive and intensive pressure uh, to expand. So in, in terms of extens uh, extensive pressure, what we're talking about is that companies need to constantly require, acquire more land, appropriate, privatize or grab uh, more land. And in terms of intensive pressure, it means more environmental crime, deforestation, more uh, intensive use of pesticide and um, uh, uh, illegal uh, uh, labor uh, relations or exploitation of labors or even modern slavery, which is very common also in regards to the agribusiness economy. So whatever bank now supports and funds this process like ING is doing is funding and supporting and intensifying land concentration, land conflict, the use of pesticides and all of this that, that the use of pesticide means in terms of deaths and communicate and contaminations of peoples, of lands, of soils, of water, and the end of their making their livelihood an impossibility, as well as as well as supporting the continuation of racism and gender dis discrimination in the country. Next slide, please. So now I will just look at some specific cases for us to, to have a, a, a better idea of ING's involvement in, in all of this conflict and environmental crimes. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, it's important to mention that the Dutch state has a responsibility in these actions, uh, not only for giving, uh, subsidizing various processes, but also the production of knowledge and um, the uh, ideological support that allows for for these uh, for a bank such as ING to continue to support such projects here in Brazil. Now, these are the few cases uh, where the Brazilian and Dutch ministers of transport, for example, signed a memorandum of understanding on infrastructure 
Then in 2012, Arcades, a consultancy firm, elaborated a large work plan for the Ministry of Transport, mapping out Brazil's rivers uh, and waterways for transport, uh, giving priority to, to the transportation of soya beans. And then uh, two years later, the, the Arcades also elaborated a, a report on these, on these possibilities where the consultancy firm uh, identified the Tapajós River, which I will, will talk about in, in a couple of minutes, in the, in, in the state of Pará, in the Amazon, as having a large potential for soy, for soy transport. Then in, in 2013, uh, collaboration with Dutch Knowledge and Research Institute, subsidized by the Dutch state, to create Dutch business opportunities coordinated by Panteia uh, came up the, with uh, proposed multi-cycle transport corridors in Brazil as part of a Brazilian Dutch corporation in the field of infrastructure. They came up with various different transport corridors, but um, put emphasis uh, on the so-called Center North Corridor as a priority which covers 74 several infrastructure options uh, in the region, which is from Mato Grosso to Pará. So to get the, the production from Mato Grosso transported to the ports of Pará to then be exported uh, to the country mentioned above, reducing the costs of, of transport. And, and the priority in this center north corridor is a railroad that goes from Mato Grosso to Santarém, which I will talk about at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. So ING has been supporting global commodities traders in Brazil, uh, dominated by four companies, no? uh, ADM, Bungi, Cargill, and LDC. Um, next slide, please. Which are, are related to a few uh, specific cases. Next case, please. Next slide, please. So. Before I do so, it's, it's important to emphasize the difficulty that we have here in Brazil to access information on, on the operations of ING, ING specifically to, to what companies, what operations, what projects uh, the country, the bank is involved with, uh, making it very difficult to hold the bank accountable and uh, allowing it to further its, its operations with not much scrutiny from, from the country. Next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, a case which has uh, recently been denounced is the involvement of Cargill, Bungi and Kofco uh, in, in buying soya that was produced uh, by a producer that had been already fined by the government for 12 million reais for being involved in deforestation. So these three companies bought from Viagra and, and Alianza that were buying soy from this, this producer that had already broken the Brazilian legislation, uh, environmental legislation, deforesting uh, areas of, of forests. Next slide, please. Bungie has also been denounced in, in other processes for being one of the the companies most responsible for, for the destruction of the Brazilian Cerrado in 2020 due to deforestation and, for example, buying uh, from a company that was responsible for the deforestation of an area twice as large as Manhattan. So this company, uh, um, indirectly, but, but very much directly involved in, in deforestation of, of areas in the country. Next slide, please. They are also directly in, uh, and indirectly involved in processes related to land grabbing and land deals, which all lead to territorial ex expropriations of indigenous and traditional people, either directly or indirectly making their ways of living impossible due to, to the use of pesticides, to pollution, to contamination. So one of the cases is, again, Bungi, Cargill and LDC that are buying land in Topajon region that, where there is evidence of land grabbing, leading also to increased speculation and land conflicts. Next slide, please. 
A case which was also very much denounced was one involving the Guarani indigenous people in Mato Grosso, which accused Bungi of buying sugarcane produced uh, on, on their land, so on, on land stolen uh, from the Guarani people. Next slide, please. This is an, an image so showing the plantations. Next slide, please. And an indigenous uh, Guarani leader saying, no, we don't want sugar cane on our land. It hurts our health, including the health of our children and elders, and it poisons, contaminated uh, the water. Next slide, please. Another case which we can mention involving indigenous people is, is Kajiu. Uh, which was denounced for buying soil from farms uh, in, in conflict with the Munduruki indigenous territory in Santarém, Pará. Next slide, please. This is an image of, of the plantations and, and resulting from uh, deforestation. Next slide, please. No. These companies, as I said, are largely involved in land deals. And since 2000, there have been at least 250 land deals involving 213 different foreign enterprises to promote grain crops, forestry projects, energy projects, livestock farms, mining, and so on. Uh, Bungi, Kajiu, and Kofko are amongst the foreign company mostly involved in the, these deals. And these land deals, they accelerate the expansion of agriculture frontiers, increase new re rentism strategies of capital accumulation, rises land prices, intensifies land conflicts, and, and force small producers, indigenous people, and others uh, to leave their land. Next slide, please. Another case which we can also uh, mention is relating Cargill in the Tapajós region, responsible for the construction of a port complex with the capacity to ship 5 million tons of grains per year, uh, which has been, uh, since it was uh, before the construction and, and ever since, identified as a decisive factor for the growth of production of soya affecting indigenous riverine and kilobolas peoples in the region. Next slide, please. Cargill has been uh, denounced for fraud in the licensing reports, for non-compliance with commitments assumed by environmental agencies, uh, accused of uh, depriving indigenous peoples, Kilombola and riverine peoples, of their natural resources essential to their livelihood, to production and reproduction, all of which have, have taken place without prior consultation, which goes against the International Labour Organization. Um, and also due to the transportation of, of all the soil in the region, the uploading and uploading of the grain, uh, we see large curtains of toxic dust which affects the rivers, affects the fishes and so affects rivering peoples that depend on their Tapajós River for their livelihood as well as families living near the port. Next slide please. Now to end I'll just uh, bringing a few uh, um, phrases by these peoples affected uh, by these companies, no, especially Kaju and, and Bumji, you know. So Kaju is responsible for drastic and irreversible changes in our way of life. Fishing has become unfeasible after the transformations promoted by the port. Ten years ago, you used to go down here on the riverbank to catch a fish. You only had to bring a net of 50 meters. You sold fish like you sold it. This is Cesar, a fisherman from the Tapajós River. Next slide, please. This is an indigenous leader, Alessandra Munduruku, says, with soy, what we see is deforestation increasing more and more to make room for its expansion. As a result, our rivers, our streams are drying up. We indigenous people do not make soup out of soy. We don't feed our children with soy. We see these many soy plantations, sometimes 100,000 hectares, just by one owner. Land and more land and deforestation. This quest for more and more land. In the entire region where Kajiu is located, they are destroying nature all around and expelling and threatening the indigenous peoples that live there. Next slide, please. Another uh, indigenous leaders in the Tapajó uh, region says, Kajiu is a symbol of agribusiness and deforestation. 
What for capitalist development, for us, it is going backwards. It is a symbol of so many impacts for the people of the forest and for the people of the waters. Cargill for us is a symbol of destruction. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, a Quilombola, no, uh, descendant, uh, African descendant in rural communities, who says that the grains fall from the boats and the fish end up feeding on it. And it has the negative impact on the taste of the fish and on our skin. The fish in general starts to have a different kind of flavor. It no longer tastes how it used to when they lived in clear waters and fed only on fruit. Next slide. So, um, to, to I've, I lost track of time, so but uh, I have about five minutes um, to go. Just want to say a few words on on refinance. Next slide, please. Which is uh, very high on the agenda uh, nowadays, and, and basically what we question is what is being done in name of in the name of the climate. No? So agri business more specifically, is one of the fastest growing sectors in the global market for so-called green, social or sustainable financial instruments. The total value of green bonds devoted to agriculture and land, for example, has increased by 59% between 2019 and 2020. ING is a major player directly uh, related to the green bonds or supporting the agribusiness companies to do so. Next slide, please. Just give a couple of examples. Kofco has a sustainability linked loan with the support of ING. Next slide, please. So does LDC, again, uh, with the support of ING and Robobank. Next slide, please. Oh. With, with implications which we don't even quite know yet, uh, the full extent of the implications, but we do know that it provides a further argument to roll back on the much needed social and environmental regulation while still depending heavily on governments to generate demand through laws and policies on green investments. So with the creation of investment funds, for example, another uh, implication is that foreign capital can buy bonds and have an opportunity to evade restrictions on foreign ownership of land uh, in Brazil. Next slide. Companies will be able to claim that they are reducing emissions or that are, are green, getting paid, for example, via carbon credits or, or uh, green bonds, while not changing practices and leading to other conflicts related to so-called avoided deforestation or forestation products, most of which will lead to an increased race for land, threatening the life of the forest peoples and waters people and violating food security and sovereignty. Next slide, please. They allow dirty companies, many of which are supported by ING, as we have seen, to raise funds, clear their name of environmental concerns, while continuing to engage in overall environmental and socially problematic practices, as seen here. Next slide, please. The net zero emissions targets, nature-based solutions, ESG and sustainable and all green finance narrative is used to legitimize the agribusiness model, guarantee expansion and increase corporate territorial control. Not only do they create disputes over land and territories occupied by different peoples, uh, they also incorporate their knowledge into the logic of the market, as we see with many projects related to the bioeconomy, but they also blame communities for environmental problems, hiding the role of large landowner, agribusiness, banks, investment funds, and the state itself. Next slide, please. So just to end, uh, I would like to, to mention, as you saw uh, in the slide, the relationship with the Brazilian government and the Dutch state, that the Tapajós region was mentioned as a priority, as was uh, the centre-north corridor, and specifically a railroad. This is a railroad that is raising various concerns uh, for communities already impacted by the soya-related infrastructure project, but uh, that now are fighting against the construction of a hydroelectric complex, this railroad and waterways that were in, in the reports uh, produced by Arcadis uh, related to the opportunities of D Dutch investment and Dutch corporations' involvements in infrastructure in Brazil. And this is a project that also involved Bungi, Cargill, Dreyfus and Amagi, uh, which count on ING 
support. Uh, th this project is is a will be it's a railroad constructed from Mato Grosso to Pará, and what they state is is that the Cerrado, which is in, in, in Mato Grosso, has less environmental restriction requirements than the Amazon, which will lead to high returns on investment. So you take the soya from a place where people are not looking at so much as the Amazon, where requirements are, uh, are looser, and you transport it to Pará to then export to Europe and other countries. Next slide, please. This is, this is uh, a map of the, the railroad. Next slide, please. And the concerns that, is that uh, multiplication of all the effects that we have already talked about. So more deforestation, contamination uh, of soils and of waters and of air and land conflicts. And the federal government has already stated that without consultation, it will auction the, pro the, the project by the end of this year. The construction of railroad is also one of the key drivers for Brazil to abandon the Convention 169 of the ILO, since it has not been consulted any of the indigenous people that will be directly affected by these projects. Next slide. This is an indigenous leader saying, our land is the closest to the railway and the study says it will not be impacted. We just have to remember the history of Bear. He won six three, which is a, a, a railway, and see the soybean plantations that are already bordering our reserve. Imagine with this ferrogrão. There are already pesticides killing all our fish. After this project, businessmen will come and will force with more force and cut more forests. We need to be heard about the problems that already exist and those that are yet to come. Next slide, please. And why does this all happen? because Brazil is the country of impunity and banks like ING know that. Agribusiness corporations from all over the world know that. Less than 10% of assassinations of land and environmental defenders go to trial, it's around 8% of cases. Less than 3% of environmental crimes lead to any source of payment of accusation of condemnation. So we say that is this the comparative advantage that Brazil has and that interest actors such as ING. Okay, just the next slide you can pass very quickly, which is just wanted to say that there is a lot of resistance uh, going on by indigenous peoples, quilombolas and riverine, small farmers, la, uh, uh, organizations in support of these peoples, uh, research institutions, you can pass the slide to denounce all of these environmental crimes, to defend these, these territories and all that these territories mean uh, to the various peoples that live in them. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. Next slide, thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrina, for your contributions and your very clear uh, facts that, and, and uh, points that you made today. Um, may I now ask the judges if they have any questions for Fabrina? Yeah? Yes, you can just, as, as precise as you can. Yes. Muito obrigado, Fabrina. A very good presentation. A lot of detail as well, yeah? Um, so I'm going to try brief. In the last slide that you presented, you make mention of the fact that ING is aware of the conditions that it is supporting and it seeks to make higher returns based on those conditions. Could you provide us with some details of how, from this, uh, all of the data that you have shared, has this been presented in a way in which INJ, uh, INJ and the Dutch government have been able to respond? And if, it, if I'm allowed, very specifically, because I see in the data that you present, after 2014, 2015, there seems to be 
an increase, an acceleration in some of these criminal activities, even whether it's legal or illegal. <laughs> However, that's defined. Deforestation is deforestation. Yeah? So has there been any specific change in the behavior since the coup in Brazil? And as a consequence of that, has there been uh, a response from the Dutch government and IMJ? Do I, do I reply now? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. So I think that the, there are two ways of, of seeing this. No, uh, One is what happens in the territories. And the other one is the narrative used by companies and used by institutions such as the ING. A clear answer, first of all, no. There has been no response from the ING or from the Dutch government in relation to these processes. Since the coup in Brazil, we have seen a rise of a discourse uh, from the agribusiness on sustainability. We, ha we have seen letters uh, uh, signed by agribusiness corporations, by investment banks from around the world involved in deals in Brazil, calling for uh, a reduction in deforestation and for improvements in the indigenous policies. On the other hand, however, we see this as a strategy because what these companies are giving as a, res as, as a response to these anti-environmentalist and, and anti-people's policies is more green economy, is more uh, nature-based solutions, uh, no, so more public, uh, how do you say, um, advertisements related strategies, but that also don't only clean their images, but guarantee more accumulation so they can legitimize themselves while creating further products and services based on the extraction, uh, the continued extraction of the environment and all the effects on, on, on the peoples that we have mentioned. So this is a strategy to maintain extraction not to stop it. So we want ag a sustainable agribusiness to continue to expand soya plantation, to continue to expand oil and mining, et cetera. What we see is the expectations are a rise in these productions and not a decrease. So no response. And what I mean that, that um, they know what is going on is that this has been historic. For years, we have a model that is based on environmental crime, environmental racism, uh, discrimination of women and all these devastations that I have shown. So they know this is precisely why these corporations are in Brazil in the first place. So uh, any institution that fin funds any of this, these corporations know exactly what they're coming into. So, but they hope that this impunity will, will let them uh, continue to acting as they always have. So no response and no expectations of response. Okay. Any any others? If you have any questions, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for that very very clear presentation. Um, it's shocking presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I just like two questions, um, just to clarify a couple of things. You want you you talked about one of the. One part of the uh, uh, role of the Dutch state um, has been in subsidizing uh, the companies um, and uh, I assume also ING. And I, I'd like to, uh, whether you could give some example of the types of subsidies that have been provided. So that's one question. Uh, you also talked about the ideological, uh, ideological support from the Dutch state. And I wonder whether I could ask you whether you consider what I'm about to read out to you as an example of that sort of ideological support. And I'm, I'm reading from FMO, the Dutch um, uh, Development Finance Institution's website, uh, where it's talking about investments it's putting into a particular um, uh, private equity fund um, that uh, deals in 
uh, agribusiness investments, particularly logistics and technology. And it, it, um, it describes the funding objective as being to foster um, private sector-led growth, um, but mainly to ensure stable and safe access to food supplies for a growing population. So the narrative being that um, these investments are necessary to feed a growing population. And I wonder whether you could comment on that and whether you consider that sort of narrative, which is, in my view, a very one-sided narrative, is um, propaganda um, and the sort of ideological support that you were um, describing. And, and my last question relates to your slide on resistance, um, <clears throat> and particularly to those efforts being made within Brazil to build an alternative um, economy, an alternative way of, of uh, living that do not involve the um, exploitation and financial crimes that you described. And I just ask, you know, um, are there investments in that economy that ING could have been making? In other words, did it make a choice to invest in the destructive as opposed to other forms of less, of, of um, uh, more socially coherent and cohesive um, and environmentally coherent and cohesive um, investments? Okay. Um, in terms of subsidies, um, which I mentioned, they go from direct support to the, to the corporation, but also when they support, uh, come to Brazil and, and write up a, a, a memorandum of understanding with, with the government, when they support research institutions uh, from Holland you know, to, to come up with a plan of, of infrastructure, uh, when they support the production of knowledge, you know, when they map out uh, uh, a region of the Amazon and state that this region has a potential for transport and has a potential to increase the, the exports of soy, as an, as an example, you know, or, or to, to reduce the costs of exports of, of soy, they are subsidizing this model also. So it's not just the direct, funds that are given to corporations this is this is i think it's an important discussion because it, it, it's what they also use as a strategy to say it's not our responsibility no it's it's not to to count on the whole chain involved so if they give funds to bungie and bungie buys from another company and this company buys from an illegal producer they can say but we didn't know we supported only one company or they can say that, that, that they, they are directly involved. But when they produce knowledge, showing and emphasizing uh, with the Brazilian government, this is a region that has the potential to be exploited even more than it is. This river has the, the potential of, of being exploited by Dutch companies more than it is. With this exploitation, these companies will reduce the cost of, of their export. They are, in, they are directly involved in legitimizing these kinds of, of projects. So it's not the, just the direct money they give to, to, to corporations. It also producing the knowledge and supporting the production of knowledge necessary to legitimize and, and guarantee the advancement of these projects. Uh, one of the main arguments that agribusiness has had is that what they do is to feed an increasing um, amount of population. There's so many things wrong with that. It's, it's difficult to know where to begin. First of all, is the, is the neo Malthusian uh, arguments that were all the whole problems that we, we face in the world is due to population increase, which also leads to blaming the, the more impoverished and, the, and more specifically black people for all the problems in the world because they, they can't stop having children. The second is that, as one of the indigenous leaders says, we don't make soup out of soy. My children don't eat soy. These products are not produced for food. First of all, they don't stay in the country. And second of all, soy, for example, go to feed cows. They don't go to feed most of, most of these, pro these products. They don't go to feed humans. 
the sugar cane produced now is 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 used also for agrofuels no to deal with with the 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 denunciations in relation to to the the climate costs of of these corporations so these products don't produce food they don't stay in the country uh and what they do produce is full of pesticides so it kills people contaminates uh and it and it kills people and it uses up much more land than than other products use here in brazil and and i'm guessing in in many other countries 80 percent of the food that we eat is produced by small farmers. It's not produced by agribusiness. Um, thirdly, in regards to alternatives, what we have seen is a, is a historic de decrease in any kind of support for, for this, this production that feeds us, you know, for agroecology, for, for the production that, that takes place with, with just uh, labor relations that is organic that doesn't use pesticides that discusses the whole the whole chain the whole model of the production of food so we have seen a decrease in any kind of support uh, this has been historic in brazil no agri business has a pro approximately 80 percent more funds than than the products produced by agri uh, family farming or produced by other communities um, and this is is becoming even worse now with the with the bolsonaro government so there's always a choice there's data there's evidence there's production of of reports of videos uh, events that are called on by social movement by organizations and by re research groups so there's definitely a choice and a choice has been made thank you for the question thank you for brina thank you very much for that uh, before I open up the questions for the jury, I think we have another Brazilian here who would like to contribute and to add to Fabrina's presentation here. So may I ask Angelica de Freitas e Silva to say what she wishes to say Thank you, Rada. Fabrina, muito obrigada. Before I start, I would like to say Marielle Presente in her name and on the name of all of our leaderships who fell fighting the militarized historical forces against our resistance. So Marielle is one who felt not for this specific struggle that we are discussing today, but by the same forces. So I would like uh, to link what you said and the importance of this um, to the Dutch government being historically linked uh, to the ING's uh, uh, corporate crimes, uh, environmental crimes. Because the first time the Dutch arrived in Brazil at 16 something, they weren't uh, the Dutch state. They were the West India companies, the Dutch West India. And they remained as so until the 18 somethings when the Dutch government, uh, well, they, they, they left before that, but the name, the company, not exactly in Brazil, but elsewhere, uh, the company was um, uh, an independent uh, corporation linked to the Dutch government. Something very important for us realizing here by linking uh, ancestral, uh, um, our ancestry to the transgeneration, transgenerational uh, um, cr uh, climate crimes is that uh, capitalism hasn't been established in itself and it's not just about profiting and, and capital accumulation. It arrives as a colonial combo. And you evidence that really well how the colonial combo works in Brazil. These colonialities, they are co-constitutive and inseparable. Racism, patriarchy, uh, territorial racism, geopolitics, the oppressor's historiography that we are taught in our schools, epistemic violence, militarism, colonial knowledge, and above all, the role of law 
of the colonizer that remains for no explainable reason to this very day, allowing that states and corporations together historically are exhausting resources and our vital energy. On that, I would also like to bring again Alessandra Munduruku on a very, very brief poem that I'm going to read in Portuguese and translate it to English, and I'll finish my, my intervention. Um, Alessandra Munduruku said, um, she denounced that the World Alternative Water Forum, FAME, in 2018, what the Brazilian disgovernment of Bolsonaro and his uh, gang are doing to the territory of uh, their people uh, in the state of Pará, something that uh, you have mentioned very well and clearly. So, quoting Alessandra. Os rios são nosso sangue. A água é sagrada. É nossa mãe. Queremos nossa floresta de pé, nossos rios limpos. Estão matando a natureza. Querem exterminar nós, filhos da terra e das águas. Mas nós, Munduruku, não vamos deixar. Vamos fazer alianças com ribeirinhos, quilombolas, pescadores. Vamos lutar juntos com outros países e povos. As hidrelétricas, ferrovias, mineradoras, a soja não vai passar. Nosso sangue vamos derramar e, se for preciso, para o Tapajós e todos os rios salvar. And now I'm, I'll follow with the translation. The rivers are our blood, water is sacred. Our mother, uh, uh, water is sacred, is our mother. We want our forests standing, our rivers clean. They're killing nature. They want to exterminate us, children of land and waters. But we Munduruku, we won't let it. Let's make alliances with riverine dwellers, quilombolas, fishermen. Let's fight together with other countries and peoples, hydroelectric, railways, mining companies. The soybean shall not pass. Our blood, will, we will spill, and if necessary, for Tapajós and all rivers save. So, to end my, my intervention is to say that our struggle is for life, not for the right to live. Our struggle is for having the capacity of surviving the territory without having to uh, mimetize coloniality for the very survival. So when one comes to say, oh, but if you remove the company or the investment, what are they going to do in Amazonia, in Mato Grosso, in Pantanal, or the, what, what's going to happen then if you take Ma Valley out of Brumadinho, where there was a dam collapse that killed over 300 people and the crimes are still uh, unsolved, as well as Marielle Franco's crimes unsolved and all the ING crimes in Amazonia and the rest of Brazil are unsolved because this law is not made to protect us. To make my final remarks, reflecting about intergenerational climate crimes uh, necessarily involves planning. This word that has been captured by the colonial disciplines of business management. They think of planning as means to guarantee a future within the constraints of linear historiography of modernity and its institutions, grounded in the colonial intention of domination. As the prosecutor was speaking earlier, um, this, this uh, business financial oriented language that is difficult, intentionally epistemically violent is uh, intentionally made to detach any type of decolonial planning, any type of local control, and any possibility of uh, decolonized peoples taking back that right, uh, sovereignty, uh, their um, authority over their bodies and their territory. So the challenges of using the rule of law to protect the most vulnerable demands deeper knowledge about how the tools that we used to fight, such as legal uh, mechanisms, substantive law and procedure, were historically formed and attributed of meaning. In doing so, the painful realization that this framework of rights is rooted in colonialities and will therefore demand violence to be viable. So we don't want the right to live, we want to live. Thank you, Alessandra, very much for your talk. Thank you for that intervention.
from Brazil. We are happy to have another intervention. Uh, I can now op throw it open to the members of the jury to ask Fabrina questions uh, or, yes? Um, sitting here as, as a member of a jury that um, can sit in judgment of these assholes, um, I am curious about what, uh, uh, in the local situation there, what is the dynamic between courts and laws and uh, the direct um, people who are impacted it, um, uh, with this intervention that um, I just sat through? I'm inspired to ask, what is the role that we uh, here in sitting in judgment of a situation far away can play with our with our evil eyes cast in the direction of ING um, and our judging feelings of that. Um, and then also uh, specifically within, within Brazil, what is the dynamic between courts and um, people's movements? I, I'm sure it's varied and multiplying. Um, you know, how do you trace those feelings? Yes, yes, Fabrina. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll start with with that that question. Um, uh, hang on. Angelica mentioned Brumadinho, no, the, the related to Valley, uh, where a dam uh, exploded, killing uh, over two hundred people, workers of Valley mainly, including its own workers. But six years ago, there was another environmental crime, one of the largest environmental crimes known to history, uh, involving Samarco, which is Valley, but also uh, B.H. Billington, translate the, <laughs> the words in my head. Six years ago, killing people, killing their livelihood, destroying territories, destroying land, uh, destroying the whole region, which based all of their lives on a, a bacia, the basin, uh, Rio Doce, Rio Doce Basin. Um, so ask me if after six years, these peoples have re re received reparations. After six years, has anyone been, been accused or had to pay for this environmental crime? No. Six years and the peoples are still struggling to be recognized as affected people by this environmental crime. So that is the relations between affected people and courts in Brazil. We did, uh, we do have one or two uh, you know, people that we can count on in the public attorney, but, but these are also people that, that go, uh, are threatened, that have their lives threatened, and some of them leave the cases because their families are being threatened. And for a while, uh, these were the people considered also an obstacle to development in Brazil. So any public defender that is in the support of the, the communities and the peoples affected are also in danger. Are also defenders that, that um, are in danger, most of them, if they don't continue, if they're not killed, they leave uh, the, the cases. So the pressure on, on the support is, is immense. And, and Increasingly, even even now with the uh, even more so now with the Bolsonaro government, it's a whole architecture. No, it's the executive, it's the legislative, it's the judiciary, it's the the means of communication, it's the education system. No, it's a whole architecture that works together to guarantee that this model is in place and continues uh, to be to be reproduced. And many of these, these uh, communities and peoples uh, are threatened also in their struggles. No, they, they, many are killed, as, as, as I showed you, and, and many are threatened. So some leave the country, they, they go on to do other things because they are afraid for themselves, for their lives and for, and for their families. And um, we have a program here in Brazil, which is a, a called Program for, for Environmental Lands and Human Rights Defenders. But how can it work if the state gives with one hand what it takes from the other? How can it work if it's the state that is responsible for these defenders being in, um, threatened in the first place? So it, it cannot work. And just to, to, to relate to this and, and what Angelica 
mentioned um, is that, that yeah, colonization as we know it may have ended, uh, but we lived we live under coloniality and modernity, which is based on the logic of progress, on the logic of development. And most, a lot of the arguments that these companies give is that they create jobs, they create development. So how is, how will, even in progressive governments, this was the case, no? Progressive governments in the whole of, of Latin America pushed forward what we called the consensus of commodities. And one of the arguments was to fund social policies to fund um, other policies. And what we see is first that the jobs created are temporary, uh, mostly involve dangerous activities, where workers are contaminated. Um, they, they end after a few months. Most of the, the high, more qualified jobs are given to people that don't live in the regions where these projects are established. And there is another issue, which is uh, the Dutch disease. So, most of you probably know, or, or Maldição dos Recursos Naturais, uh, I forgot the name now, but it's, it's the fact that uh, countries which have abundancy in natural resources uh, will be all, uh, constantly uh, stuck uh, in, in, I don't want to use the word of development, but it doesn't lead to the development, doesn't even lead to the development that they are talking about. There are deficits in, in, in Brazil's accounts because even in the, the super af, super af, the excess in, in commercial in, in exports is not enough to, to counterbalance the deficits related to all of these um, um, foreign companies. So it's not a model that creates not even the development, the economic development that they are talking about, let alone the, the, the other forms of, of lives that, that we are talking about. And um, as Angelica was saying, what, what, what came to Brazil and what persists is not just an economic system, it's a gender system, it's a racial, a knowledge system, a religious system, a division international of labor, class system, a uh, uh, militarization of system based, based on states, which is based uh, on the domination of nature, on the domination of women, on the domination of, of, of black people and all of those populations that that produce knowledge or, or, or produce ways of living that doesn't separate nature from, from society, that sees nature as complement, complementary to, to, to their ways of living. Uh, so this is, this is the way of living that, that is being tempted to being destroyed, not only because they get in the way of, of the, by occupying, by living in lands that the, these companies are interested in, but that they show us that another way of living in this world a non-capitalist way, a way that doesn't dominate and exploit nature and other beings is possible. 